Okay, um, well, good afternoon, and thank you all for joining PQA today for our quality forum entitled Assessing the Impact of a Pharmacist-Led Data-Driven Intervention to Improve Adult Vaccinations. My name is Matthew Pickering, and I serve as PQA's Director of Research and Quality Strategies. It is my pleasure to moderate today's session. Today's session. Uh, before we begin, I would like to call your attention to two housekeeping, housekeeping items. Uh, one, um, attendees are, are all muted. You're in listen-only mode, so you're encouraged to submit any of your questions throughout the presentation using the question panel located on the webinar control panel. At the conclusion of the presentation, we will read the questions for our speakers to answer. And the second item, uh, this quality forum is being recorded, and so this recording will be posted on our website next week. So uh, for the panel uh, today, we have two guest speakers. Uh, Dr. Margaret Pasquale serves as a research manager at Comprehensive Health Insights with expertise in health economics. In this role, she manages teams of researchers involved in collaborations with external clients. Dr. Pasquale has extensive experience developing study designs and managing research projects in various therapeutic areas, such as cardiovascular disease, COPD, diabetes, heart failure, inflammation, mus uh, musculoskeletal conditions, oncology, opioid abuse, and pain management. Her work at Comprehensive Health Insights has involved retrospective and prospective analyses across multiple therapeutic areas. Prior to Comprehensive Health Insights, Dr. Pasquale's experience span both academia and industry. Also on the call, we have Rich Shear, and Rich has had over 25 years of experience in the healthcare and, and pharmaceutical industries as a senior data analyst and SAS programmer. He currently serves as principal researcher at Comprehensive Health Insights after having worked in different capacities, including outcomes research, disease management, and consumer product safety, co uh, covering a wide range of areas from osteoporosis to cardiovascular disease and pain management. Rich specializes in the use of SAS, SQL or SQL, and Excel to query large administrative claims databases, run statistical analyses, uh, and generate reports and present results and interpretations for use in executive summaries and publications. He regularly contributes to study design, protocol development, and co-authoring of abstracts, manuscripts, and posters. So today, um, I'll open up this session by uh, discussing a, a pilot study that PQA coordinated uh, with uh, partnerships from PQS, the Pharmacy Quality Solutions, and CE City, a premier company, Rite Aid, and of course, Humana and CHI, or Comprehensive Health Insights. And really, the pilot was really designed to try to put a new solution, a technology solution, technology solution out there uh, for community pharmacies to be able to integrate uh, disparate data sources to um, improve adult vaccination rates. And go to the next slide here. Okay. So we know um, very much uh, so that um, there's a burden of disease for vaccine preventable diseases such as uh, uh, influenza, for example, as we see here with we see that uh, millions of people get affected, which uh, can result in uh, expensive healthcare resource utilization and hospitalizations, which can ultimately potentially lead in death, depending on uh, the, the population. And the benefits of receiving uh, an influenza vaccine are quite real, uh, which you save uh, uh, a lot of, of money from, from preventing those healthcare resource utilization visits, and also just the number of people that are infected. And when you also look at uh, the burden of disease from other types of vaccine preventable diseases, such as uh, herpes zoster, uh, pneumococcal vaccination for the elderly and also high risk patients and even hepatitis B and pertussis, uh, you, can, you can translate those benefits of having uh, vaccinations for these diseases uh, to, to real dollars spent and also to real quality and uh, improved quality for patient health. And as a nation, uh, we see this reflected in the importance of actually having these vaccine uh, um, vaccines for vaccine preventable diseases reflected in Healthy People 2020 goals and objectives. Um, and here are a series of, of four that are listed here in which we're trying to reduce or eliminate um, these vaccine preventable diseases, uh, notably for influenza for both children and adults. Uh, and also for pneumococcal disease and also herpes zoster. And the pneumococcal disease is both for the elderly and also high-risk patients. Uh, 
here are the goals that have been set, starting from our baseline, which is in blue, and both the Healthy People 2020 goal, in which we have influenza for adults that we're trying to strive to have 70% coverage or 70% vaccination rates uh, for influenza. But those who are older, 65 years and older, for pneumococcal, we have at 90%. And then also for uh, high-risk patients, 18 to 64, at 60, and then herpes zoster at 30. Uh, so really um, uh, some, some, some true gaps that we're trying to address here and trying to improve these vaccine-preventable diseases, obviously uh, improving the quality of life for patients, but also uh, reducing expensive healthcare resource utilization. And these maps are, are pulled straight from the CDC uh, website, um, some of the most recent data that we have available. And it's really um, uh, the darker the state or the darker the color, the better the coverage within that state, um, whereas the lighter uh, part of the map is, is the less amount of coverage. If you look over to the bar graph, or excuse me, the graph over there to the far right, you can see the top line in red is really that goal that we're trying to hit. Uh, uh, it's, this is the case for influenza. And then the, the black bar graph or the bar at the bottom is where we are to date. And as you can see, even across um, since 2010 all the way going into 2015 here from some of the most recent data we have, we are still missing uh, uh, that, that goal and still have a significant gap. And this is just for influenza. If we do go over to uh, pneumococcal and high risk pneumococcal, we see similar types of trends. Again, the maps being the darker the color, the darker the state, the better the coverage within that state. But across uh, nationally, when we, when we look at the trends nationally, compared to the goals that we have set in Healthy People 2020, again, that's the red bar, uh, the black bar is where we are. We still have significant gaps in, in how we are supposed to increase the coverage for these specific patient populations. And then ultimately, um, the herpes zoster, similar, similar uh, type of trend here, where we we're still have a significant amount of coverage um, improvement that we can do uh, for, these, for these patients and these, vac uh, these vaccine-preventable diseases. So why is this the case? There are a series of challenges and barriers. We can't really just point to one. But broadly, if we think about um, some of the challenges and barriers, we have this misperceived value uh, associated with certain vaccinations. You can think about anti-vaxxers or uh, things that uh, are out there in the media that can potentially uh, state that vaccinations uh, cause certain types of autism or things of that nature that, that really get into this mainstream media and social networks that prevent people from really trying to see the value in getting a vaccine. You also can think about how um, if there's a certain flu vaccine that was given, but yet the flu is still rampant, that's like for the, the cases we had this past year, uh, patients may see there's no value in actually getting vaccinations because it doesn't really work uh, as well as it should. There's also in inadequate infrastructure, and this is to say that we don't really know or be able to easily access a patient's record for vaccinations to understand if they actually have true gaps in, in, their, in their vaccination history, both from the flu from year to year, uh, or also any of those other vaccines, uh, vaccine-preventable diseases that I mentioned uh, previously, like pneumo and high-risk pneumo. Um, this, this comes from both state registries and, and, and information uh, systems within those registries, but also being able to connect various different providers to claims history and, and patient records to be understand if there is a true gap. This leads to um, uh, missed opportunities uh, to deliver vaccines to patients. And also um, it, it can, it can uh, do over vaccination as well uh, by, by uh, replicating a vaccine that may, a patient may have already received. And then there's also insufficient access. So patients not necessarily being able to um, go to their, their physician, their primary care physician, and receive vaccines. They may not be able to actually go and see that, that physician as easily. Um, and so there's, there's that insufficient access piece that can, that can lead to a lot of the, the, the coverage gaps that we've been seeing. And really, not pulling one of these levers is really not going to solve the problem. It's really going to be a series of, of, of different types of interventions and, and solutions that, that either target each one of these individually or target them across, across the board to help improve those vaccine coverage gaps. And this really um, provides an opportunity for, for pharmacy. Pharmacy has really expanded its scope over the, the past decade and 20 years by, by being uh, 
uh, being able to offer vaccines within community pharmacy settings. And in fact, some some of these uh, some data report that to for patients to go get vaccinations as opposed to the physician often offices being the, the first. And pharmacies uh, and pharmacists can can administer all of the adult uh, vaccinations that that are that are uh, recommended. Uh, through guidelines uh, across all 50 states. And really, um, you talk about accessibility. Well, uh, patients can easily go see their community pharmacist or their pharmacist within the community uh, a lot easier they can, than they can with their primary care provider. Uh, there are estimates between uh, five times to one uh, for, to, to see their community pharmacist versus their health care provider. Um, and then also pharmacists can expand not just within that pharmacy setting, but other types of uh, uh, organization or excuse me, other types of community settings, such as schools, uh, such as churches, malls to deliver vaccines. So really talking about that access barrier that, that we hit on uh, previously, there's this, there's this opportunity for pharmacy to really increase the utilization um, um, of pharmacists and also to administer vaccines that that really um, hit on a lot of those different barriers that I mentioned previously. So we decided to partner uh, with uh, both Rite Aid and uh, CE City, the premier company, PQS, the Pharmacy Quality Solutions, and, and Humana, and also Comprehensive Health Insights to develop a very new solution uh, for community pharmacy to be able to uh, leverage uh, different data sources in a way to really look at patient uh, uh, vaccination history and identify real gaps in their vaccination coverage and then be able to administer uh, those appropriate vaccines to patients within the community setting. But again, then hitting on this ability for pharmacists to um, educate about the vaccinations uh, and then also uh, increase the access and leveraging uh, those data sources to be able to do so. So. The goal of this pilot was really to improve vaccination rates for both pneumo, uh, and that's pneumo for older adults and high-risk pneumo, and influenza through this pharmacist-led inter intervention um, for Medicare Advantage uh, uh, patients specifically within prescription drug plans uh, that were Humana beneficiaries. The study design really was a pilot intervention within Kentucky uh, using Rite Aid pharmacies in two districts. Uh, one being the Lexington uh, area, which was the intervention district, and the other group two here was the Louisville, which was the control district. Um, so once these uh, pharmacies were stratified, uh, the group districts were randomized both to the intervention control, um, and then the pharmacists in the intervention districts received active reporting of individuals that were indicated to have a gap in, the, in, in pneumo or influenza through a web-based application called EQIP, which stands for the Electronic Quality Improvement Platform for Plans and Pharmacies. And we'll go into that a little bit here in the next few slides. The pharmacists in the control districts, however, received just passive reporting. They, they, could, they could access patient information by just asking a patient if they've received a vaccine in the past, say like you know the flu from year to year, or, or if they, they were aware of a pneumococcal vaccine, but they had no active type of reports that were provided through the EQIP platform. And then the impact of this program was just to look at the rates of the pneumococcal and influenza vaccines uh, that were evaluated. So what is the EQUIP platform? Um, so the EQUIP platform is really just cloud platform. It's web-based, as mentioned previously, and it provides some standardized benchmarking uh, to assess the performance related to certain medication use and, and patient safety measures. And in this case, what we did is we implemented some vaccination measures for influenza, pneumo, and high-risk pneumo, and allows the, allows the pharmacist to be alerted uh, to then be able to provide the appropriate uh, types of interventions. Um, the EQUIP platform has, has two visualizations, if you will. Um, one is for health plans to uh, allow them to uh, view real-time performance tracking on their network pharmacies, for example. And the other is at the pharmacy level. And this allows for pharmacists at the pharmacy level to do some real-time real performance tracking on, on those metrics within the platform and allow them to do some benchmarking compared to their peers or other pharmacies that are also using that platform. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, and I've noted the, the three types of um, vaccinations here on the left, the high-risk pneumo, general, and then the seasonal influenza. The picture that you have on the right is the dashboard itself. Uh, however, uh, the flu is not listed in this. It's kind of cut off that down there. But we have the high-risk pneumo and, the, and then the general pneumo. So I'll draw your attentions to that. So you can see in 
uh, for the high risk pneumo, for example, if we go from left to right, you can see an overall trend line. You can see the number of patients that are eligible for this particular type of uh, vaccination based on the metric. And then you can see the overall rate for that specific pharmacy. Higher is better, so you can have a goal of a 50%, of a so the red meaning you're less than that goal. And then you have this little outlier tab, and then you can also see how you're comparing with other organizations and your store average. I wanna draw your attention now to this outlier tab. When we talked about the intervention itself, we have this active reporting uh, that I mentioned before using this equip platform. Well, a pharmacist uh, within the inter intervention group would be able to click on this outlier tab, which will then drill down a little bit more, more so into that specific rate, and they can actually look at how their, um, their, their trends a little bit more in depth. But with the outliers specifically, these active reports are then what's noted here on the, on the right side, where pharmacy one, two, three, you can see the patients are being indicated here. Uh, in this case, it's for the, the, the pneumo for older adults. So those who are eligible to receive that vaccine, they're looking at their medical claims and also their pharmacy claims. If there was a gap, then that patient would appear in the outlier, outlier field here. And so that pharmacy or pharmacist could then print out this report. They could, they could uh, uh, put this into their, op their standard operations for whenever Mrs. Jones or patient A would come in for their refill. If they had an indicated gap here in, their, in this outlier field, the pharmacist can make the appropriate intervention on educating the patient about the vaccine and then even providing that uh, patient with the vaccine. Now, if the patient felt that maybe they would like to talk to their physician or their, their primary care provider, or if they've also felt that they've received this previously, the pharmacist can then go in to these little fields and indicate that appropriately. Uh, so if the patient was contacted, the, the ph pharmacist can indicate that here. If the patient uh, refused uh, or if the, if the vaccination was administered, um, that pharmacist could indicate that in, here in these fields so that that way that patient won't be contacted again or won't be bothered with, with, this, um, with this type of interaction with the pharmacist. So this pilot, like I mentioned before, um, was a partnership with all of these different organizations. This was a Pfizer-funded initiative in which PQA was the coordinator uh, and the primary investigator of this initiative, working with Humana uh, in, in, in their two districts in, in Kentucky, the Louisville and Lexington districts. The technology piece and, of course, the dashboard that was utilized with, was uh, through the Pharmacy Quality Solutions and CE City, a premier company. Uh, and then the pharmacies were, were Rite Aid pharmacies. Uh, and then the Comprehensive Health, Health Insights, which is the data analytics group within Humana, uh, des helped design the study and evaluate and do all the analyses for interpretation. Our time frame for this was January 1st, 2017 to April 30th, 2017, and Rite Aid staff were trained uh, via on-demand teleconferencing uh, beginning uh, um, December 23rd, 2016, and they were encouraged to regularly engage the EQUIP platform, again, to look at that outlier field to identify those active reports that were generated. Uh, the EQUIP uh, application was loaded with, uh, with claims monthly, so had a monthly refresh uh, that received a medical claims and pharmacy claims from Humana to identify those gaps and those patients who did were, were actively put into the, the outlier field. Um, and then the onus was on the pharmacist to really engage patients. And I mentioned they could do that the next time the patient could had a refill or they could actually make that outbound call if they decided that's how they wanted to incorporate this type of, of intervention in, into their uh, standard operations or normal operations. So the PQS team, the Pharmacy Quality Solutions, was also able to monitor if pharmacists actually logged into the equip platform. And if they found that that wasn't happening on a regular basis, they would notify, uh, notify Rite Aid personnel, which then would uh, contact those pharmacies or pharmacists to make sure that they actually were logging in and using the platform and, and delivering that interven those interventions appropriately. So uh, now I'll turn it over to uh, Rich, who will go through the evaluation metrics and the study design and results. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Um, so I'm going to walk you through the uh, study design, some of the population characteristics, and the results of the intervention. Uh, we started off with, uh, as Matt had mentioned, we had three separate cohorts that we looked at. Um, we had pneumococcal vaccination in older adults. Um, these were all 
uh, just so you know, drawn from a Medicare Advantage population in the Humana Research Database. Um, so we had 65 and over um, in the older adults for pneumococcal. We also had a high-risk population where we looked at pneumococcal vaccination. Those are members aged 19 to 64 years who had one of 12, uh, or at least one of 12, uh, separate um, high-risk conditions, which are listed below. Uh, they had to have at least one of those during our baseline year of 2016. Uh, and then there was also the influenza vaccination, which really is, is uh, everybody is eligible for all years, uh, age six months to 89 years. Given that this is a Medicare population, the tendency is to think that they are 65 and over, but there are quite a few Medicare Advantage members uh, who are younger than 65 uh, if they, and they will qualify or be eligible for Medicare if they have certain disabilities or chronic conditions, um, hence the younger uh, persons. And uh, the, the, um, the key metric was really to look at the proportion of patients that received each of these vaccinations and to compare those uh, across the intervention and control groups. And we did this using uh, logistic regression, both crude and adjusted models. Uh, we used logistic because it was most appropriate given that we were looking at a single binary outcome. Uh, once members receive the vaccination, they're no longer eligible to receive it during the time frame of the study. Uh, in the case of pneumococcal, they only receive it once in a lifetime. Uh, so next slide, please. So this is the uh, attrition flow for the for the three cohorts. We start off with all, so we limited the study uh, population to those Medicare Advantage members who had at least one prescription fill at a Rite Aid pharmacy in one of the Kentucky, uh, the selected Kentucky districts. So while we had a, a uh, Lexington area was randomized as the uh, intervention area, it was the, uh, uh, the, the urban Lexington Frankfurt area and a sur surrounding uh, rural area. Uh, and then in Louisville was the control. We had the um, urban part of Louisville plus a surrounding rural district there as well. Uh, there were a total of, I believe, 101 pharmacies, uh, Rite Aid pharmacies that covered those areas. So members had to have at least one prescription fill in 2016 at one of those pharmacies to be eligible for the study. Uh, we required everybody have uh, continuous enrollment dating back to the beginning of 2016, so that we could assess baseline characteristics, uh, and then enrolled through June of 2017, which is the time frame for which we looked at those who received um, uh, vaccinations during the inter intervention period. Uh, the intervention actually went through April, uh, as Matt had mentioned, but we allowed two months of lag to allow for members who perhaps it was inconvenient at the time of the messaging to receive the vaccination, or they preferred to be vaccinated at their uh, regular physician's office and not, not at their pharmacy. So we did look out six months. Uh, the first cohort, we um, uh, limited it based on age and then those that were pneumococcal vaccine naive against this uh, pneumococcal is a once in a lifetime vaccination. Uh, so we looked back five years and those that, that had already received one uh, were, um, were excluded from the study sample. And we ended up with 20, 2,135 patients. As you can see, slightly more than half were in the control group. The, uh, the middle cohort is for influenza uh, based on age restrictions and then not having have received the flu shot in the year up to that point. So we look back six months dating all the way back to July of 2016 through the end of uh, through December 31st. So basically those that had not yet received a flu shot that season uh, and we ended up with uh, about 2,800 patients, again, a little more in the, in the control group. And then for the high risk, we limited that based on age. As you can see there, we do lose quite a few patients uh, by restricting it to under 65. Uh, and then we required the same five-year um, pneumococcal vaccine washout period, and then also require that they have one of those uh, baseline high-risk conditions in 2016. And that brought us down to a smaller cohort of 740 patients. Uh, so next slide, please. So uh, we're going to look at some of the, uh, the, the patient population characteristics. Uh, we have the three cohorts listed here, and then we looked at, in this case, these are demographics. So in the older cohort, we have mean age of, of 73. It was about 67 in the influenza cohort, and uh, as expected, younger in the high risk, about 56. Uh, female, a little more than half, as we typically see in the Humana population, actually less than half in the high risk. Um, the uh, white race was um, a little higher than we might normally see. Usually it's around 87% in the Humana Research Database. Here it's the low 90s. Uh, the region is interesting in the, the fact that this is a Kentucky-based intervention, so you might think that they should all be in the south region. Uh, however, what's interesting about the census regions, the way they're drawn, is that Indiana and Ohio are actually part of the Midwest. So, uh, and especially in the case of Louisville, 
uh, or the control area is sits right on the Ohio River, is right on the border, and a lot of people in the Louisville area, and in fact, some of the, the pharmacies too, are based in southern Indiana. So while these people are in the Louisville area, they're technically in the Midwest region, some of those people, uh, which is why there's a, there's a difference there and why it's um, you know in the 80s as opposed to close to 100%. Um, those that qualify for a low-income subsidy, uh, you can see about about you know 20% or so, uh, about twice that much in in the high-risk cohort, um, and uh, and higher in the in the Louisville area, uh, and very few received home health benefits. So next slide. Okay, so see, these are some of the clinical characteristics we looked at. Uh, so we looked at the total number of prescription fills in calendar year 2016. Uh, this is total number of fills, not total number of visits uh, in the sense that a patient could receive multiple prescriptions per visit. Uh, but this gives a good idea as to pharmacy utilization. Uh, interestingly enough, it, it was higher in the Lexington area uh, in all three cohorts, as you can see. Um, the Dale Charlson score, uh, for those that aren't familiar, is, is a, uh, an index um, capturing one's general health status, looking at the number of comorbid conditions they have. Uh, this is actually higher, as, the, as you'll see below with some of these um, uh, key cr uh, chronic conditions it was actually higher in the Louisville area. Uh, both the um, Dale Charlson score and the prevalence of some of these conditions, such as diabetes, uh, about a third of the population, uh, or more than half in the high risk group, uh, heart failure ranging from about 8 to 15 percent, um, COPD in the 20s, and um, cancer around 20 percent. These are some of the more prevalent comorbid conditions. Uh, I also notice also with cancer, the rates are, are higher as, as they were with diabetes in the high risk pneumococcal cohort. Uh, so next slide. Uh, and then we also looked at some baseline healthcare resource utilization uh, in terms of number of physician office visits, emergency department visits, and hospitalizations. Uh, as you can see here, there were very little differences. The only difference was, was really the number of hospitalizations slightly higher in the Louisville area. Um, and in the high risk cohort, the um, utilization of, um, you know, compared to the other two, of office visits and emergency department visits was higher, uh, as you might expect in, in, a, in a high risk uh, sicker population. Uh, so next slide. So these were the uh, rates, uh, the vaccination rates uh, as a percentage of the population um, that were captured during that six month period. Uh, so you can see the intervention group, 16% of individuals received a, uh, in the older cohort, received a pneumococcal vaccination versus 10% in the control area or control groups. Um, for influenza, it was 7% and about 4%. Uh, and then the high risk was um, five and a half versus seven, but as you'll see, the numbers were very small, and we were actually required to suppress a lot of the information for that particular cohort, uh, given some of the, the HIPAA regulations. Um, some of the other statistics here which are interesting are that uh, about for the pneumococcal vaccinations, a, a little more than a quarter were actually done in store versus at a doctor's office. Uh, that may be just that uh, patients uh, feel more comfortable going to their own personal doctor to get these vaccinations done, or maybe they have a history of doing, of, of getting vaccinations there. Um, the case of flu shot, it was actually higher, you know, 30 to 40% were done in store versus, versus the doctor's office. And then we have the um, by month. And uh, what's interesting here is that for the pneumococcal, you see they tend to be front loaded, you know, about, or about a third of the vaccinations were received in, in January and another you know, 20 percent or so in, in February. And uh, a key reason for that is that the because pneumococcal vaccinations can be received year round. Um, but the messaging was done in such a way that if a member was messaged the first time they come in, they're not going to be repeatedly messaged as they continue to, to come in to, and utilize the pharmacy and fill more prescriptions throughout the six months. Uh, so what happens is just that um, because of the, you know, the outlier program and as Matt had showed, the ability for the pharmacist to check off members who are already messaged, uh, most of that is done up front and most members therefore will get their vaccinations done early in the, in the program. Uh, in the case of the influenza, it's even higher. Uh, ranging from 55 to 77 percent, and that makes a lot of sense given that the um, flu is most frequently occurring in the wintertime. Uh, most patients actually will get their flu shots in the fall. Uh, if they haven't gotten them by January 1st, they will want to get them very quickly. Uh, getting Most patients do not get flu shots in the spring. Uh, at that point, they'll just wait for the following year, and as you can see, the numbers there are very small and have to be suppressed. So um, next slide, please. So these are the results of the adjusted 
logistic regression models. And as you can see here, we sort of highlighted these were the factors. So we, in the adjusted models, we controlled for the demographic utilization and clinical characteristics that were significant uh, between the two groups. Um, the, um, but the key measure is the, the rate of, uh, or the likelihood, the odds of patients in the intervention group being vaccinated, in this case for pneumococcal and older adults versus the control group. Uh, an odds ratio of two, 2.05 to be precise, uh, meant that members in the intervention group were actually a little more than twice as likely to be vaccinated than those in the control group. Um, some of the other factors that, uh, that we controlled for, um, the only one that really stands out here is that Midwest region. Uh, and this is sort of an interesting phenomenon. They were actually um, 2.7 times almost as likely, uh, even though they were in the control area or largely in the control area. And uh, that's a phenomenon we're not entirely certain of is why uh, persons in Indiana and pharmacies in Indiana were more likely to be vaccinated. But that, uh, that was the only other significant factor in this model, aside from, of course, the key measure of the intervention versus control groups. Uh, but you can see there some of the other factors that we did include in the model. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide. So here is the influenza vaccination. And once again, we have an odds ratio right around two. Uh, I, sh um, I should have mentioned that the crude um, odds ratio was 1.7 in the pneumococcal versus two in the adjusted. It was about 1.8. Uh, or 80% more likely um, in the crude model for influenza. Here it's uh, in the adjusted model, it's around two. Uh, again, we have the effect of, of the Midwest region. Uh, another thing that stands out here is also the presence of COPD, which is significant. Uh, and members who had COPD were 60% more likely to receive a, a flu shot, uh, which I think is, is, is a good sign, good indication. Uh, but you can see there the other variables that we controlled for between these groups. Again, these were those that were different at baseline. Uh, none of the other factors were significant predictors of um, members receiving flu vaccinations. So um, next slide, please. Uh, and then the high-risk um, pneumococcal cohort. Uh, this one, as I mentioned earlier, really had a, a small sample size to work with. And uh, while the, uh, the percentage of members in the intervention cohort actually uh, received, um, or lower percentage received the vaccination, uh, the results were not statistically different. Um, and uh, given the small sample, uh, the only conclusion we can draw from this is that there was really no difference in vaccination rates across the intervention and control groups in the high-risk cohort. Uh, and once again, you can see the other the other factors we controlled for. Uh, again, there were no no factors indicating other than uh, the only one that, that you know, even approaches um, significance is COPD. Once again, uh, members more with COPD are more likely to get in this case pneumococcal vaccination. Okay, and then uh, next slide. Okay, so um, I believe Margaret is going to um, take over from here. Thanks, Rich, very much. And so given the results that Rich just shared with you, what this slide here does is, is um, extrapolate in terms of implications. So this was a pharmacist-led intervention in community pharmacies. Um, you know, it does require that someone's walking into the pharmacy in order to to receive the messaging, but um, what this slide is is trying to share here is that uh, if this pilot intervention um, indeed were to be re replicated elsewhere and the same results were found, one could extrapolate to the entire U.S. population. Uh, so beginning with the approximate size of the civilian non-institutionalized U.S. population, and then of course, um, it would have to be among those with health insurance coverage because the equip platform, uh, the application is utilizing information that's coming from the health plans. Um, and then, um, you know, taking, assuming uh, specific rates of vaccinations that would already occur without the intervention. So in the case of uh, the pneumococcal vaccination in older adults, the assumption was that 75% of the population age 65 and older would have received a pneumococcal vaccination. Uh, that comes from an NCQA state of healthcare quali quality report um, 
excuse me, 2016, and then a 60% rate of flu vaccinations and in, in uh, the population six months and older, uh, you could then estimate the size of the population not vaccinated. And then uh, what we applied here was a very conservative estimate um, using the crude difference uh, in the percentage points between the intervention group uh, and control group um, from the results Rich shared. But in fact, uh, those percentage points would likely be a lot higher since um, the odds, the likelihood was was doubled between the two. Uh, but multiplying out those um, two columns then gives you the result in the very last column on the right-hand side. And it, it just um, indicates that, in fact, you know, if you're extrapolating to a much larger population, there's potential for, for a pretty big impact. So that, that's the point of this slide. I think a lot of folks in the audience um, are also very familiar with return on investment calculations. So in order to do that, uh, one would have to determine, you know, how many, uh, whether it's uh, pneumonia or flu um, uh, uh, cases that may have been hospitalized could have been prevented and then and then uh, weighing those cost savings against um, the, the cost of the program. So if you'll go to the next slide. So here, there are just a few discussion points. And um, once we're finished, we completely open it up to others for, for questions, comments, and, and contributing to this discussion. But uh, basically, we um, would hypothesize that expanding the intervention to a broader population of pa patients filling scripts at any retail pharmacy across the U.S. could have a very beneficial impact on the total vaccination rate. And um, we, our study team that in, included folks from all, all the different organizations listed at the beginning of this study uh, discussed this and felt that um, it's, it's convenient and, and we do know that patients uh, do frequent a pharmacy, a community pharmacy more frequently than, than their doctors, their provider's office. So this is a, a good venue to, to offer um, the opportunity to receive a vaccination and uh, that in addition to that, a pharmacist can provide some personal attention to patients when they've um, messaged the patients and if patients had any questions. Uh, the one caveat is that it requires patients to walk into the pharmacy. They, they, they need to be walking up to that pharmacy desk and, and filling a prescription in order to be um, messaged uh, and have that interaction with the pharmacist. So that's the one caveat. Next slide, please. And then a few limitations here. Uh, what, what we share today are specific to an individuals enrolled with Humana in, in Medicare Advantage plans and filling at uh, specific Rite Aid pharmacies in the, in the state of Kentucky. Uh, so this may not be representative of the general population. So we would recommend this pilot be replicated or, in fact, expanded to a broader population to see if the results can be replicated. Uh, and then, of course, any vaccinations received but not submitted for reimbursement would not have shown up in the claims data. So that's, that's a limitation of, of um, using the claims data. Then uh, in addition to that, for this study, um, we followed a, in accordance with a CAP survey that any individuals with either a PCV13 or PPSV23, the 23 valent vaccination at any time uh, pre-index would be excluded. But in fact, the uh, guidelines currently recommend first receiving the the um, PCV13 and then followed by the PPSV23 after 12 months. So someone was um, not uh, flagged as an outlier if they received just one of these, if there was a record of just one of these. And um, 
again, limitation of the claims were that uh, Rich went back five years in the data, but it's possible folks uh, received one of these vaccinations elsewhere and that, and that those were not recorded in the claims. And then finally, assumptions used in extrapolations would need to be confirmed and updated over time as, as the data change. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, we conclude here that a pharmacist-led intervention was effective in, in increasing the likelihood of receiving both the pneumococcal vaccination amongst uh, older adults ages 65 to 89, and, and then also the influenza vaccination amongst individuals six months and older. Uh, patients in the intervention group are twice as likely as those in the control group um, to receive those vaccinations. Uh, as far as the high-risk cohort, the intervention did not appear to have a significant impact on the rate of uh, vaccination amongst um, for those for the vac for the pneumococcal vaccination. Excuse me. Thanks. And then I'll turn this back over to Matt. Great. Thank you, Margaret, and thank you, Rich. Um, so now we're going to have a few minutes uh, we have left here for some questions, some Q&A. It looks like we've already had some questions come through, so I'll see with this first one. Um, in the methodology, the onus uh, on the pharmacist to engage, uh, were there any differences noted based on how pharmacists engage patients? So that's a, that's a good question. Um, the onus was set on the pharmacist. However, uh, within this pilot, we did not instruct nor capture how pharmacists decided to actually integrate this intervention and, and, and contact patients. So, uh, as I mentioned previously, and, and doing some actual site visits uh, with the Rite, Rite Aid pharmacies, um, some pharmacists printed out the list every every month, that outlier list, and, and, and put it to where they would easily see it and, and cross off patients as they went along. Um, some of them actually uh, made actual phone calls um, uh, to the patients uh, to see if they, they can increase um, uh, the patients uh, to come in and, and actually uh, get their vaccination. So it, the actual, uh, how the pharmacist integrated into their normal operations, um, that was not instructed nor was, was, was captured. Um, so I'm gonna ask this uh, of Rich or Margaret. Um, there was a question about, um, what are the HIPAA rules that led to the suppression of sample size? Um, I, 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 I can take that one. Uh, there's really two rules. Uh, they're, they're different uh, from one another. One is that uh, we're um, not, um, uh, we should not be reporting, I should say, on patients 90 years or over, uh, which is why we cap the cohort at, at 89. Uh, and that is because at that point, there's very few persons who live to be that long, who have certain conditions and could potentially be identified uh, uh, by virtue of just their age and having a certain condition. So uh, one of the rules is that we suppress um, or set a maximum age to 89. The other is around the, um, the small sample size. And for the same reasons, HIPAA requirements uh, indicate that any cell sizes uh, less than 10 be suppressed. Uh, and the, the thinking there is that when you get to that small of a number, you already know enough about that patient that they were in a certain cohort, had a certain condition, or received a certain uh, vaccination or so forth. And with that few patients, you could potentially identify who that is. Uh, so the goal there is really just to protect um, the individual's personal health information. And with small sample sizes like that, uh, it is it is possible to ascertain who those persons might be, although unlikely it is possible. And so it is a regulation that we typically comply with. Great. Thanks, Rich. Uh, another question. So once vaccinated, how quickly was the patient removed from the outlier list? Um, great question. So um, um, whether the patient got a vaccination within the pharmacy or in certain cases, like, like we saw in some of the, the results, uh, they could get vaccinations from their uh, primary care physician. The equip dashboard was refreshed monthly, so new data files would be received from Humana, both from the medical and the, the pharmacy side. And so if the patient did receive an actual vaccination from the pharmacy or the from their PCP uh, the month prior, 
those patients would then not appear in the new, the new month uh, that the data files were received. So it was refreshed monthly. Um, so that that's um, uh, that's how often that that happened. Um, so it, it was then the pharmacist would be able to go in and then see an, either new patients that would appear in the list um, and, and see old ones uh, removed. Um, Next question. So what is the benefit of using EQIP uh, versus a state immunization registry? Also a really good question. Um, so with the EQIP dashboard, the, the data that were, is being utilized uh, or the data that are being utilized is pharmacy and medical claims. Um, obviously, there, there are some benefits to having more of a, a, a view of, of uh, patient's vaccination history, say if they were, weren't with uh, Humana prior to um, prior to this intervention, there, that would be captured within uh, potentially a state registry if that state registry was really robust. Um, so obviously there are limitations to the data that we have available, uh, but but the the benefit of this is is the fact that it's merging the medical side within the to, to pharmacy, bringing that medical claim history that uh, you don't necessarily have all of that information with, with just pharmacy claims. So it's bringing that in and trying to see if there's true gaps. There's always uh, the benefit of having more data, uh, thus with the state registries, especially if it's a robust registry, um, but um, 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 we're, we're limited to the data that we're coming in from the Equip platform, which just claims. Um, let's see, another question. Um, are there any immunizations that may not benefit from this intervention? Um, good question. Um, there could, potentially could be. Um, however, you know, the, one of the things that we have uh, concluded here is that this intervention was just on pneumo, high-risk pneumo and flu. You could also think about how this could be utilized for um, herpes zoster or the shingles vaccination, especially if you're thinking also with series types of vaccines. Um, there's, there's ways to where you can start uh, indicating outlier patients on, on series completions. Um, so um, it's kind of difficult to see, think about what immunizations may not benefit from this intervention. Um, you can maybe even think about how this intervention could benefit um, both adolescent populations as well, not just with flu, but maybe like HPV, for example, if there's a plan that is uh, you know, wanting to be able to um, engage adolescent, the adolescent population around AP, HPV vaccines, um, this intervention could also be utilized in the same fashion if that pharmacy would like to offer um, HPV vaccines. Um, hey, uh, Matt. Yeah, go um, ahead, Rich. I just want to jump in and kind of add to that uh, a little bit. I think as far as, I, I really don't think in, in, that they're, uh, the vaccination itself, because of the fact that these members are being messaged through their pharmacies, um, I don't think that there's any that would be ineffective for. I think it's more around the population that might be eligible to receive those. So for instance, say a meningitis vaccine, which is typically administered to um, uh, to adole young adolescents may not be uh, pharmacy utilizers in the way adults or older adults are. So I think that might be the only potential uh, limitation in that might be the, the age of the, uh, of the potential recipients of the vaccination and how likely they are to use one of their uh, pharmacies. Great. Thanks, Rich. Uh, and another question, uh, Rich or Margaret, uh, was, was, was gender considered in the analysis? What a general um, question. It, it was it was considered. Uh, I mean, it was um, as far as we did capture and report on that. Um, there were no differences across intervention and control group. Uh, so um, they were and they were basically very typical of what we would see in the general population. It was a little more than half were female. Uh, we did not control for that in the models just because they were so similar, nearly identical in the, in the across the, the, the three, across the intervention and control groups in the three cohorts. Great. Thanks. Um, another question. Um, how did you identify patients with high risk? Did you use ICD-10 codes or something else? Uh, they were based on IC, a combination of ICD-9, ICD-10, I believe actually would have been all ICD-10 given that we were looking at 2016, the time frame as such. So yes, it was based on members who had an encounter with a physician uh, having a ICD-10 diagnosis of one of those conditions, one or more of those. And that right. had to be dur during the calendar year of 2017, or, excuse me, 2016, so recently. Great, thanks Rich. Um, Here's another question, uh, and this might be something that 
I could answer. Um, so uh, were the documentation or was the documentation that pharmacists uh, added into the equip captured by the study personnel um, and did these get sent to the health plan? Okay, so this, so Rich, maybe this is a question, the first part for you. So the documentation uh, as far as um, if, if the patient was contacted and refused or if the patient said that they actually received it as the pharmacist went in to actually document that with, uh, with those check boxes, was that captured by study personnel and, and, and then uh, how was that uh, incorporated into the analysis? Well, we did utilize the claims uh, to, to determine whether or not the patient received the vaccination. So um, if a member said to a pharmacist, I already received, um, I already got my flu shot or my pneumococcal vaccination, so I'm not interested today, and it turns out they never did, um, then we would not have flagged them as, as having one. So in other words, the patient's word uh, only uh, is um, only as good as far as the interaction with the pharmacist. In the claims data, there would therefore be no evidence of that. If they truly never did, or maybe they thought they did and they forgot, or you know, the, um, if there's no evidence in the claims that there was a or that there was a claim submitted for reimbursement on behalf of one of those vaccinations, then that person would not be credited with having received uh, the vaccination. That could either be submitted through the medical benefit if they had it done at a physician's office, or it could be through a pharmacy. Uh, through the pharmacy itself. I mean, they could also be messages and say, oh, I just had my flu shot here last week. Turns out they didn't. In that case, they would be taken off of the, the outlier list um, and uh, would therefore would not be considered having. So so in a sense, I guess to, to answer that question in, in summary is that um, there had to be evidence in the claims that an individual did receive the vaccination. We didn't necessarily take them at their word. Uh, the only limitation, as Margaret mentioned earlier, is if, the, um, if it was, say, paid for out of pocket, or it's not submitted, otherwise submitted through the medical or pharmacy benefit, then we would also not have captured that. Great, thanks, Rich. And then the second part of that was, does this get sent back to the health plan? So, um, with the case of this pilot, no. Um, the the that documentation that a pharmacist would make within the equip, equip dashboard, uh, in in this pilot, no. But it could be. So uh, if reports are generated every month and sent back to the health plan so that the health plan can see how well um, the pharmacy may be performing, for example, on, with, with improving vaccinations, um, those types of notes that uh, the pharmacist makes within the dashboard could be attached to those reports and also be shared with the health plan. But for the purposes of this pilot, um, they, they were not. Uh, it was just, it was just uh, for us to be able to um, uh, also be able to include part of that analysis and some of the um, uh, reasons that Rich had, had mentioned. Um, so I think we have time for one last question. Um, so uh, how did you determine which stores the equip dashboard, which stores equip dashboard the patients showed up in? Uh, did they show up in multiple dashboards or just one? Uh, great question. So this was an, um, an attribution algorithm um, that the Pharmacy Quality Solutions, or PQS, utilizes based on the majority of claims that would be filled uh, uh, by a patient at a specific pharmacy. So if a patient filled uh, more than 50% of, of, of claims, uh, of drug claims, or, pharma or just, uh, filled the prescriptions more than 50% of the time at a specific pharmacy, they would be attributed to that pharmacy, and that's where that patient would show up uh, for that vaccination uh, type of intervention. Uh, so it's it's based on an attribution algorithm, and it's 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 uh, mainly for the majority of claims that are filled at that specific pharmacy that patient would be attributed to. Great question. Um, so I, I I do apologize. There are some other questions here listed. Uh, we will make sure to try to address those as well after after. Um, uh, the quality forum here, but there are some last few remaining uh, uh, minutes here that we'd like to go through some remaining house, housekeeping items and some uh, types of uh, advertisements. But hey, um, Matt. Yeah. Hey, Matt. Margaret. I was going to just, um, Rich, you may want to clarify too, but on that very last question, uh, I believe for the purposes of this study, if if there was a patient going to an intervention pharmacy as well as a control pharmacy. Uh, that patient was a, a excluded from the study since there could be uh, spillover mm -hmm. effects if, if potentially right. they were assigned to a control group, um, but they were also filling in an intervention pharmacy. So I just wanted to make that clarification. Yeah, that that is correct. Um, now, since they were they're in completely different parts of the state, we expected that to be low, and it was. It was about one half of one percent of members met that criteria. So we did exclude those. 
Uh, however, if a member went to multiple pharmacies, say within the intervention district or within the control district, that was okay. Um, mm -hmm. So th those members were retained in the analysis. Great. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Margaret. And I really appreciate your time uh, for walking us through this, this, uh, the results um, of this pilot. Um, uh, and and uh, it, was, it was a pleasure to work with you on this, as well as everyone else uh, that was uh, contributed to this, both Jesse McCullough from Rite Aid, uh, also the PQS team uh, as well, uh, those folks at, at, at Humana. And um, it, was, it was just a, a, great, um, a great pilot, great program. So thank you both very much for your time to present these results. Um, so um, I wanted to bring to your attention a couple of other ho housekeeping items for those still on the call. Uh, uh, next month's quality forum is on Thursday, May 10th at 1 p.m. Uh, innovative state-based approaches to, a to addressing the opioid epidemic in the Medicaid population. Uh, so during this quality forum, two leaders of uh, North Carolina, uh, two leaders in, in, in North Carolina share their insights from an ongoing analytic project on prescription opioid uses and prescribing in the North Carolina Medicaid population. And they'll discuss the overall trends rel relative to opioid prescribing and utilization, safety, and quality. The North Carolina analysis includes a look at the quality of the new starts on opioid therapy, beneficiaries with concurrent use of prescription opioids and benzodiazepines, naloxone use among concurrent opioid and benzodiazepine users, and beneficiaries with prolonged exposure to high-dose opioids. As an increasing number of states uh, delve into their data to begin identifying inappropriate and potentially unsafe prescribing, the use and application of quality metrics is critical. Understand next steps uh, as North Carolina moves from the data analysis to contemplating next steps in working with the provider community. Registration information will be sent out next week. Also, the PQA annual meeting. If you haven't registered to attend our annual meeting in May, visit our website uh, uh, to do that there. It's the link, uh, you can just click that uh, to, to register, make sure you do. And I want to highlight our opening keynote is CMS Administrator Seema Verma, who will highlight CMS's efforts to advance quality value-based care, including Patients Over Paperwork Initiative and Meaningful Measures Initiative. Also, if you missed the announcement last week, PQA is, ple is pleased to introduce ACPE continuing education credits to some of uh, the sessions for the upcoming annual meeting. So you will now get uh, CE credits for those who are pharmacists looking to get that CE uh, by attending this meeting. Um, so uh, look look at the agenda for those appropriate CE sessions. So select sections will be will um, will each offer a maximum of 0 .5, 0 0.75 contact hours for credit for pharmacists. So thank you all very much uh, for attending this quality forum sponsored by our partners at PQS or Pharmacy Quality Solutions. We look forward to having you join us for our future quality forum webinars, and we would appreciate your feedback in today's quality forum. Please complete the short survey at the end of this webinar, and goodbye. And again, a big thank you for PQS for sponsoring this webinar. Thanks so much.